and I'm going to show you some of the documents that are available today that you will be getting. First of all, hopefully you're seeing this. Uh, and um, it's railroad records and it's your notes of the entire lecture. Uh, and hopefully you are seeing this. Uh, it's about five pages long, I warn you, just so you know. Uh, let's see, I'm just going back into here. Stop share. Okay, the next share screen is uh, a little ditty that I have called uh, the Great Northern. Uh, and this is all at the Minnesota Historical Society. Not available online, folks, but they're really, really good about helping people if you give them the finding aid number that is in each one of these things. And then down at the bottom, at the very bottom of this, I have also shared with you the consolidated seniority list for 1968. And that's just for 1968. Uh, that's because some of these things are just not available. And so we still have to look in archives. Okay, the next one would be what I'm calling uh, the Railroad Expert Materials. And these are books and places to go get uh, your materials. Uh, it's only about two pages long. So uh, enjoy. A lot of the books are available in uh, libraries. And now, hopefully you are all muted. And so I'm going to go to the share screen. I'm going to go actually to the presentation and I'm going to begin that presentation. Linda, can you see that? Okay. All right. So we're, today we're going to talk about railroad records, and I'm going to remind you that these are the dominant times of U.S. railroads uh, being about 1840 through about 1970, and that's generally the time I'm going to be talking about uh, what records might be available or uh, what whatever. We're just getting one more admitted here. So the first thing I'm gonna be talking about is reminding you to always apply context and set your thinking in within that era you are going to be researching. If you are researching someone in the late 1800s, you need to think about the kind of records that might have been available. You need to be thinking, for example, about uh, how much record keeping was done by the US government at that point. Uh, because anytime records are required, of course, we can say yay, because we're going to be able to go after those records. I want to remind you then, that train travel was dominant from about 1840 to about 1970, later for many places. I'm gonna tell you, it remains dominant in Europe today. So uh, that's a very, very interesting thing for you to think about. 
Uh, think about the era in which your ancestors lived. How and when did they utilize train travel? I know my family utilized train travel all the time, even though we lived in a quite rural part of Western Montana. We knew, for example, that if we wanted to go see grandma, grandpa, uh, or our aunts and uncles in Haver, that it did require going to the station in Whitefish uh, to be able to to climb on the train. And at that point, then we knew that it would, we knew how long the journey would be. And I can remember when I was about four or five years old, I got to go with my mom once and uh, it just tickled me pink that I got to go for quote, unquote, free. So freight expectations, what were they for people who lived in cities and people who lived in towns? I can tell you that uh, in Montana, in Great Falls, actually, when the train came in here in 1887, within one week, we had all kinds of freight coming in via train, things that had not been available before. Albright uh, furniture in Great Falls suddenly had an entire building full of uh, all kinds of yeah, house furniture. Found. How, for example, did transcontinental rail travel change America? You need to begin to think about that because it changed it immediately. How did travel influence the, tra the travels of one of your ancestors' relatives? They started visiting one another. How were trains used locally? And how did trains affect rural areas and metro areas? And how are we being affected by trains today? So let's talk about the goals that I have for your genealogy toolbox and mine. Today, I'm hoping that you remind yourself again to uh, sharpen your skills as you examine a file. First, set a goal for specific information you want. Be realistic. Find out what's available in the first place and where it's available. Find out what you did not or record what you did not find and record that source. It's going to be valuable to you later on when you're trying to remember what you were what doing. Promptly summarize all the information you find, enter it into your ancestor's file, into the surname timeline, and record that source because you may not remember it. There's nothing worse than having to go back and look for that source. Learn what information may be found in railroad records in the first place, depending on the type of record you expect. One of the first things would be indexes, city and county directories, local railroad clubs, and best of all, if you have females whose husbands were railroaders and these females belong to auxiliaries, they are very, very good with uh, oh, recording the information one. and recording what know. happened, especially during strikes. That's a phone. Retirement files uh, are going to be good for you. And I'm going to show you a bunch huh. of them today or show you where to find them. And if you're looking for railroad wrecks, camera. there are some great places to go. Sharpen your skills some more prior to looking online. Take time to look at look and think about the useful terms you might be able to utilize for best results. Utilize your sure. research terms as advised by the genealogy site. You're going to get better results candidly if you enclose your search term with quotation marks. It's very, very, uh, it's a very good thing for you to be able to do that. You have to be savvy and learn to use the search terms that are described by others. You have to think about the terminology, in fact, for a particular era or a time. Uh, one of my members uh, helped me one day when I was looking at not necessarily a railroad term, but I was looking at a term and saying, what the heck is a blind pig? Well, it was a particular term used in the 20s and 30s. And in order to find some of the newspaper articles that I was looking for, I needed to know that term. 
once I found that term, it helped me a whole bunch to find some people who were acting with nefarious consequences. Best of all, I want you to use the Search Sites card catalog to see what data sets are listed. For example, at Ancestry, railroad records yields nearly 60 different kinds of materials. But if you use that same search term at MyHeritage, it doesn't list anything. It doesn't list anything either at Find My Past. So you have to be cognizant of what's being used. After you gather that fact, summarize it, enter it into your ancestors file. I know we all we all do that dance for joy when we find some information, but take take time right then to look at the information you find. What other facts are available? When you look at the Northern Pacific Railroads files for people, you, you are going to find out that they have hundreds of facts on your particular person. Don't just look for one. Look at each one of those things carefully and take the time to run out the entire record. If you have a family timeline, and I hope you do, record the source and record the info you found using those best genealogy practices. After all, Uncle Ben may have been a Gandhi dancer one year on the Great Northern Railroad, but if you look at him a year later, uh, either in his file, if you're fortunate enough to find that, or you look at him in a city directory, that year he may have transferred over and become a fireman for the railroad. Totally different thing again, and with a different seniority list. So you need to be cognizant of these things. And of course, write a brief summary statement telling what you found. It doesn't need to be more than a paragraph, but at least at the bottom, put the date. Tell me where you found it. Tell yourself when you found it and share this piece of information with another trusted family genealogist, uh, either by email or Facebook family group or whatever. I know my Quist family group shares this stuff immediately. We'll share bits of information and frequently we find that somebody else uh, keys right off of that piece of information and goes on with something else that's valuable to us all. And include the information in your family story. The fact may be brief, but your story about how you found Uncle Ben and the different things that he was into in the railroad, not just that he worked for the railroad, can be very special, especially to his particular family line. So we're going to learn what information may be found in railroad records. You need to be systematic in your search. Begin by searching out the types of railroad records that are available. There are corporate records, for example, for most all of the railroads that you will see out online if you are going to go to a major archive. You're gonna gain great perspective uh, as you look at those corporate records because those corporate records are gonna tell you what kind of businesses they operated within the railroad system and who they employed. Not, not a list of names necessarily, but the types of occupations or positions that they had within the railroad. So what do you want and who might have it? You're gonna look at our US National Archives at nara.gov. Another great place, especially if you are looking for uh, pictures, you can look at the Library of Congress at loc.gov. You can search major data sites for US railroad record possibilities, but I warn you, this is sketchy. Again, I've already mentioned ancestry, my heritage, find my past. Fold three might have a little bit, especially as it concerns the civil war in the South. Not a lot though. American ancestors, all of those are major dollar sites. So don't assume or don't think one may be better than others. They all have different stuff. And especially Google for those newspaper sites, because there are so many of them today, in addition to uh, uh, in addition to something like newspapers.com. So US railroads were regulated and regulations mean there's gonna be records. That's really great. Unfortunately, lots of those records are not out online. So plan to contact various kinds of archives and 
look at what they've got with your handouts today. You've got the one that I've given you regarding the uh, records for the Great Northern at Minneapolis in the Minnesota Historical Society. Take a look at the finding aids for that one, uh, because that's going to give you an idea of what to ask for uh, within other archives. You can look at the Interstate Commerce Commission uh, archives available again at, at NARA, and they're going to tell you some things about railroad wrecks, for example. Um, and you can look at railroad retirement board files. That's that alternative to Social Security uh, for people who were working for the railroad. I'm going to warn you that a lot of the information I've seen so far is after 1936. Occasionally, there's other information, but uh, don't expect to find that that information extends backward from 1936 if you do find a file. But it's got a lot of information about a person, uh, and they just kept collecting more things all the time. So, so the U.S. Railroad Retirement Board files, let's talk about those first with rail employees. Uh, in your notes that you're going to receive today and also on the screen, you are seeing the actual place that you can look for the RRB, that is the Railroad Retirement Board records. They are at the National Archives in Atlanta. They have files from the Great Lakes region 36 forward. They also have many other inactive claims folders from across the United States. And that's your key. Here's your clue. Inactive claims folder, folders. If the person was active up to, say, 10 years ago, those things may not have been cleared yet to be able to go to the site. As they are cleared, they are taking more of those in. So check back again. You could also look at and, and talk to the actual source by emailing that Atlanta address that is on your screen right now, atlanta.archives at nira.gov, and looking at the retirement board records. Again, by the way, anytime that you are looking for records, if I were looking for Northern Pacific Railroad uh, records, I would enclose that in quotation marks. I would enclose Northern Pacific Railroad retirement uh, records in quotation marks. And by the way, I've found simply one of the best things that you can do for yourself, no matter what, is to see the positive richness enclosed in these railroad retirement board files by going out and looking at the sample entry available there at that RRB site. It's just pulled down to the page. They've got sample entries for a fellow by the name of Edward Hoff. The full version, I'm going to warn you, it, it's more than 100 pages of documentation on this person with all kinds of things in there. What they call their abbreviated version of his file is about 25 pages. It is amazing to see what is there. All kinds of things about that gentleman as he entered uh, the system uh, and his the the various questionnaires and forms that he and his family completed through the years as they were looking towards eventual railroad retirement. For example, just to give you an idea of some of the things that I found in the railroad retirement file, I found an application for annuity filled out almost immediately upon a person being hired. I found an application for a widow or widower insurance annuity with 23 different questions or fields that had to be completed, and they are completed. There was a verification of the person's death by the particular funeral director, giving you, by the, by the way, the name of the funeral home that handled that person's death. Death certificates for both husband and wife could be found in files if there were a wife. A statement of marital relationship in the first place. It's a questionnaire, not just 
were you married or not? It's an actual questionnaire. Highly interesting. A record of the employee's prior service, different occupations inside of the railroad, occupations outside of the railroad, how the person was compensated, and when the person increased in seniority, beneficiary designations. And uh, there were some, some surprises there. So really good information. So as we look at ancestry, I've already alerted you and told you that it has a lot of railroad records, but aha, don't think that just because they have a lot of records, they have the one record you want. Do go out to Ancestry. Immediately search for the card catalog. Once you reach the card catalog, in quotation marks, place railroad records. You're going to find about 59 different things, I think, 59 different files. Yes, there is the U.S. Railroad Retirement Index, 34 to 87. And you're saying, well, Jan, if I've got that, why would I want to go over to the narrow records? I would remind you, an index is an index. That's not enough. You need to seek more. If the person's records are also available over at that Atlanta site, boy, do you want to get them? They have the United States, Chicago, and Northwestern Railroad employment records. Again, very, very different, not necessarily retirement information at all. So don't think that it will be as complete as the one that I just talked about. Sometimes they have personnel records like the Utah Union Pacific personnel records, 1890 to 1965. But look, folks, they only have 5,000 of those. Uh, so that means there's more coming or that's the limit that they scanned. You won't know until you go out and you read actually about the records. So don't just search a person's name. Go out and read also about what those records contain and find out whether or not there's going to be more. The Northern Pacific Railroad Personnel Files, 1890 to 1963, they have 315,000 of them, and they are fantastic records. I'm really bummed. My mom worked for the Northern Pacific Railroad. She was a registered nurse at the hospital that they had in Missoula, Montana. Doggone, her records are not there. They're not available yet. The California Railroad Employment Records are there, 5 million of them. Now, I've only told you five of some almost 60 kinds of records, so you're going to want to hit that site at least to take a look. Remind yourself again that if you do not have Ancestry at home, you can uh, come to libraries to be able to access that, or you uh, can probably also access it over at the LDS uh, library room. You'll have to look in your local area to see when they are open. The Northern Pacific Railway Company personnel files through 1963, employment dates, then birth date, a physical description, leaves of absence that include layoffs and strikes. And the only other place I've gotten really good information about layoffs and strikes, by the way, are in those auxiliary. Uh, units from females because they recorded actually uh, in their minutes, they record how they actually helped during a strike, what kind of food they provided, who they provided it to, uh, what they were doing, and so on. The job titles are here. The salary, the promotions, the raises, or the cuts in pay. If you lost your uh particular seniority in one area or you had to in order to be able to stay in a particular area at, rather than being moved to someone to someplace else sometimes you took a cut and pay and it will tell you that that can be really valuable information for your family there will be correspondence that's handwritten by your ancestor any letters or any notes or anything else and death date and the information surrounding that death will also be there other places to seek information, uh, we have a thing called the Railroads of Montana Seniority List site that's going to be in your notes that you're getting from Mary. 
So it's here and you're going to be able to go out and look at those rosters. Again, those are time limited. So you have to look again at the era and the time in which your particular person was working for a railroad. The Railroad Genealogical Society will do lookups. Their ambition, and boy, do they have an ambition, uh, and the uh, place is included here. They are going to try to find everything they can about everyone in every railroad. Wow. The railroaddata.com will show you 4,500 links uh, for various railroads and various places. This one and the Railroad Genealogy Society, I checked some of those, and there were occasionally uh, some that uh, were no longer active. So I warn you about that. Genealogytoday.com, the guide for railroad employees for the Minnesota Historical Society is also there. The Great Northern Railroad, that's what you'll have to use to be able to get into any of that information. I'm always interested in timelines of America's freight railroads or railroads, candidly, and this one includes both. You can look at Wikipedia's timeline of railroad history. I frankly think that's the best one. They've done a great job and I like it because they keep adding information. Look down at the very end to make sure uh, or to look at the information validity, but it looks to be pretty good to me. The Association of American Railroads also has a timeline. And then there's they have a separate timeline for the chronology of American freight railroads, because even when the major era of passenger travel passed in about 1970 to 75, and remember, it's still very current in the East. Uh, but whenever uh, that came in, they also kept track of freight railroads and they also have some things that are really worth looking at at that state-of-the-art lab facilities and the ways that they test out tracks, et cetera, in Pueblo, Colorado. That's a site that's really worth looking at, especially if you're a railroad buff or you know of someone who is. My husband comes from a railroad family. He's not as interested in the personnel files because he says, oh, well, we've already got a lot of bad stuff, you know, and all that stuff. But by golly, I could get him to look at the state-of-the-art lab facilities uh, at Pueblo. And that was a real bonus for me because he could explain some things to me. Oops. If you're looking at REC official investigations, you need to learn where to search for the best information. We do have an author in Montana who just recently put together a neat book on railroad wrecks and other disasters in Montana. Butch Larcombe, L-A-R-C-O-M-B-E, uh, is a former, a retired reporter who put together some very, very neat stories. And you can find that book in your public library. It was published in 2021. But if you're looking for official investigations, and he tells you where to find some of them there, by the way, in his book, you should look at Interstate Commerce Commission record groups. That's what that RG stands for in these particular groups through 1991. And today there's a successor agency called the Surface Transportation Board, Department of Transportation Government. Uh, that takes everything from 1991 through the present. And they the last stuff that I found was 2019 that I was looking for. So I don't know how fast they put up things on uh, their investigations, but I imagine when an investigation is completed, the, the data goes there. Of course, you could always look at local newspaper stories. They're going to be very, very good for you. Uh, you can look at nonfiction accounts in books, uh, and frequently libraries are going to have them. Another thing that I find really interesting is that if you look at survivor interview accounts at state historical societies, like the Montana State Historical Society, the Washington State Historical Society, Colorado State Historical Society, you're going to find uh, at least some interview accounts of what happened in large train wrecks, or even what happened as a person lived uh, and worked with a railroad for a long time. 
And again, use your very best judgment in putting those quotation marks around your search uh, terms, because maybe your particular ancestor did not write an account of something that happened to him or to her, but maybe someone else from their community wrote an account or maybe there was a railroad wreck right in that place. Miles City seems to have had several of them very, very close to their society, to their uh, particular area. And also the university archives in various states and railroad museums. Uh, if you have not been to museums in Deer Lodge or uh, the one that I, is really, really my favorite in Montana right now is a Harleton Railroad Museum. It's really worth the time to go see what's there. They have collected some fantastic information. And of course, you can always look at the site that I'm giving you right down below, the planeandtrainwrecks.com site, where you can begin to look for information. Whatever you're looking for here, please plan to think that it's a starting point. It is not a finish point. Although I will tell you the wreck official investigations from the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, I found to be really pretty thorough. I was looking at the one that happened in uh, Evero, Montana, uh, when our uh, Montana band was coming back from the World's Fair, and they were all involved in that wreck down by Evero. And the, the wrecks are remarkably thorough. Of course, I could always look at the local, local Polson paper and the Missoula paper also. There are a lot of different kinds of things when you're looking at those Interstate Commerce Commission records. And so you have to go through and uh, look at the various things. You're going to find surprising case files, not just in 134.7 for the time up through 1955, but you're going to find some very, very neat files in the Bureau of Traffic, in the Operating Division, and in those general records. The administrative history I spent just a little bit of time with, but it, it gives an idea of what and how they grew the things that they took charge of. So it's worth a really quick look of nothing else. And of course, the still pictures from 1889 through 1896 are a starter point for you, but I would remind you to go over also to the Library of Congress because they've got lots of records. And of course, each and every one of those archives, like the Minnesota uh, Historical Society archives, they have a bunch. The James J. Hill archives in Minneapolis has a bunch. That's a, a private place, but they're slowly getting some of that material out. Uh, so they're good places for you to look. Look at the associated occupations, uh, because remember that as they grew the railroads. They didn't just need people to work on the railroads. They had ancillary things like they had people on the railroad who were also employed both by the post office and sometimes by the railroad. So you need to look at that occupation as a special occupation if you find it in some of those records. The telegraphers or the telegraphers uh, you need to look at because they were big right through World War II and up to Korean uh, War times, and they really carried a great deal of the load. Uh, and early on, this book that I've shown you, the W.J. Sam Johnson, The Experience and Observations of a Railroad Telegraph Operator, look at that date, 1878. Now, that one you can place in quotation marks go out and look, and I'm willing to bet you're going to find the entire record out there because it's no longer controlled by copyright. So those things are usually there. Look at the special jobs that depot clerks handled uh, before they got people who actually handled uh, things that were associated with the depot. That is the storage of goods that came in uh, or the shipping department because those jobs really change and they're very specific. There are also advanced men, the real estate brokers or the publicists, 
for railroad routes. There's a guy by the name of Strayhorn and his wife, Carrie, married him, went with him for over 30 years. Uh, she said uh, hers was 15,000 miles by stage. That means by stagecoach, a woman's unique experience during 30 years of pathfinding and pioneering from the Missouri to the Pacific and from the Atlantic to Mexico. Uh, I've read volume two. We have it here in our library, 1880 to 1898. Bless that woman. I cannot believe she did that. She helped pioneering many uh, Idaho towns. He was a publicist for the Union Pacific Railway. So, of course, the railway hadn't gone to the places that he was investigating or trying to pioneer. So they went by train. So you need to look at more than just the railroad experiences. By the way, that particular book, the second book, has great illustrations made by Charles Russell. Bonus for you. MyHeritage.com is fantastic for research and uh, within their collections, but I would say your best bets, you know, when I went out and looked at railroads, I didn't find particular railroad uh, information there, but I did find quite a cache of U.S. city directories. And remember those city directories, uh, and remember they have county information with all of those small towns included. So those U.S. city directories are going to be a good source for you uh, in looking at a railroad person and what job they were working in a particular year and which railroad they were working for. Uh, there are compilations of published sources there that do include some information on some railroads. And of course, you can always search by surname if you remember to examine that surname for occupation. You're likely to find the surname, the home address for the person, the occupation, who they worked for, et cetera. Let's talk a, a, just a couple of minutes about railroads in wars, because the railroad, since it became uh, really prominent in America by about 1840, it involves some wars. I'm only going to look today at three of them, the Civil War, World War I, and World War II. Uh, when you're looking at the Civil War, there's a very exciting story that you can find under various names right out online. Uh, and this is included in your notes, so you're going to be able to see it. It's the William Pittenger book, Daring and Suffering, A History of the Great Railroad Adventure. Actually, sometimes you'll see it called Capturing a Locomotive. I found it about 10 different places out online. And it's a fun story to read, but it will tell you a little bit about the importance of those railroads in the Civil War. Uh, uh, if you could cut off the railroads in the South, as happened many times, and in the North also, then you prevented the Union Army or the Confederate Army from getting its supplies, uh, and it caused real problems. Another neat book uh, that is a World War II pictorial history was actually published in Missoula, Montana by Pictorial Histories, publishing in 1996. It's Don Denevy's book, America's Fighting Railroads, A World War II Pictorial History of Things That Happened. Here's some things you may not realize. If you were working for a railroad uh, in World War II, many times your job was preemptive. It, even if you wanted to be drafted, you were not going to be drafted if you were in a person in a position that the railroad really needed, as explained by the U.S. military. For example, yardmasters, the people who controlled the, the trains coming in and out of particular places, controlling the freight and so on. My father-in-law, Fielding Thompson, was the yardmaster for uh, the railroad in Harleton, Montana, and uh, of course did not go uh, and had a, had an exemption, not really an exemption at all, but was told you will stay with the railroad through this time. Uh, here's a really neat thing that happened in World War I by uh, their experiences in the Civil War and their experiences in the Philippines and in Cuba, 
the United States military had learned some things about getting their recruits from their training camps uh, over to railroads. And they didn't try for big railroads. They did narrow gauge. We're very familiar with narrow gauge railroad in Montana because, of course, our early timber industries also used the narrow gauge. They could be put up quickly, just as quickly taken down. I've provided a picture or two here of actually of some very rude and <laughs> rudimentary pictures of young men who are going from training camp over to a train to be shipped out from New York. Uh, here's one where they were hauling supplies for camp construction again. Uh, and uh, so that'll give you an idea of how those trains were utilized. Also, as we moved overseas, we took many of our railroad men with us. And as we captured railroads uh, in various countries, uh, those railroad men uh, used their expertise in being able to work and being able to operate those railroads, this time for our occupying forces. There's an interesting story about our polar bears. You may not know about it in World War I, but in World War I, we had quite a unit of people, most of them from Michigan, but I found some people from Montana uh, who, operated trains and and protected trains by confronting the Bolshevik revolutionaries in Siberia. You may not have realized that we had people over there, and there are some pretty good stories about it. Another one that I did not put on your list, but it's available in our library, and I'm assuming in many other libraries, called Quartered in Hell the story of the American North Russian Expeditionary Force in 1918 and 1919. Uh, and that one is also available. You'll find it, I hope, on the list. If not, I'll put it out again. This is a great story by Godfrey Anderson, a Michigan polar bear confronts the Bolsheviks, a war memoir. So you're gonna find some of these stories that are out there and they are worth reading. They are great memoirs. Uh, some of them uh, actually have diary entries, and they are very interesting to read. When these men were asked to go, they were asked to go without the necessary uh, equipment and without the necessary outerwear or any kind of clothing that they needed to really confront the Siberian winter. So their stories are amazing. U.S. Army protecting the Trans-Siberian Railroad in World War I. Uh, a couple of books that are very good. We've got Wolfhounds and Polar Bears, the American Expeditionary Force in Siberia, 1918 through 1920 in our library. It's a checkout book for our members. Uh, we also, I believe, have the Polar Bear Expedition, uh, the America's Forgotten Invasion of Russia in 18 and 19. So you're going to find these and you're going to find if you're looking for more stories, I would advise that you go over to Michigan, to the Michigan Historical Society and look in their uh, particular records for things that are already out there and are available to you fully in print. It's another great source for you. And it is something I have not written about here. So please note that if you're interested in more of those stories. Well, it's government again, gathering information and regulating railroad use in wartime. So remember, anytime that they regulated railroad use or they used the railroad, it wasn't just the military that kept the records. It was the government. And you're going to have to look at, at records that are ancillary to the military records to be able to find some things because the U.S. government quickly realized that railroads would be a useful, valuable asset. I can tell you that my great great grandfather traveled from Minnesota with the Minnesota First, quite a famous outfit, uh, all the way to Washington, D.C. when. Uh, that outfit uh, joined the Civil War right away in 1861. Realize also that if the government took over the railroads, like during Wobbly's eras in Montana or during 
uh, short periods of time when there were strikes, there are going to be records. You're going to have to dig a little more for those records, but they are worth it. Uh, remember that if you happen to find records out at that Atlanta site that I told you about earlier, all of those times, that is those strikes, et cetera, are recorded in a person's file. Those tiny railroads got used, narrow gauge uh, for army camps to the fronts and overseas in other countries, not just in ours. Check out the stuff uh, that happened during the Korean operation. And in between World War I and II, the US Army actively strategized their potential use of railroads from the leadership positions on down to local train usage and how they could immediately take over or at least get the president to give him, to give specific instructions so that railroads had to operate. There's going to be records. In World War II, in fact, many of those railroad workers were not drafted. Uh, I can look at a whole pile of people whose names I'm familiar with down in Harleton. And just by looking at those Harleton newspapers, and by the way, those are online, these people stayed in jobs that were necessary for the best transport practices. And they were ordered to do just that. Another great uh, book that I have mentioned already is this America's Fighting Railroads, a World War II pictorial history. I'm providing it for you here so you can see what the cover looks like. I'm pretty confident you're going to find it in your Montana room collections or your collections uh, just because it's so famous. Um, it's just simply one of the best things out there. And it really talks a great deal about the Great Northern Railway. Uh, the Santa Fe, various things. So you're going to get great information from this book. Railroad records for other countries are available. Find My Past uh, and My Heritage, both by contrast, even though they don't have information about United States railroad records, they have them for, for instance, my, Find My Past has them for the British Isles, the British Commonwealth Rail rec Records, also through uh, World War I and World War II. The Canadian records are also going to be available at Find My Past. That's a little more limited, uh, but we'll see because they keep bringing on more Canadian records there all of the time. Find My Past, again, uh, mainly British Isles. I want you to, rem to remind yourself, but you can, just by looking at Find My Past, you can go to all record sets. That's what they call their catalog all record sets. Then you can go to education and work, and then on to transport and railways, and you'll get some pretty great information. They're a little more likely to give at least lists of names of who were employed at various times. I warn you, they cost dollars, but you're certainly welcome in our library. We have that particular database, a uh, set of databases available for you here. Remember what you're doing, that your, investigate, your investigative questions that you've formed, not just a person's name, but what you're interested in finding out is going to determine where you're going to search. Don't shortchange yourself. Again, that context of the era and its records availability, what's there, that's important. If you can't find something online, please go to archives. Please go at, to your local library, at least, to your nonfiction reference librarians and ask them to help you to see what else might be available out there in some archives. If you want railroad retirement files, be aware of which files are available and where you're going to have to go to dig deeper to find the other ones. Be aware of newspaper stories and their availability locally. Remember, we have a thing not just newspapers.com, but you have that great free source in this state called montananewspapers.org. So you're going to want to go look. Uh, if you're just looking for your ancestor's name in a story, sometimes you're going to come up short. Look instead for the era and the time or look for what happened in the particular community. In Great Falls, we have lots of great stories of people who were drafted. Lots of great stories of people who stayed with the railroad. 
and look at those railroad ancillary uh, things that they have, like women's clubs for the particular unit. There, you may find memoirs to read, or you may look at official investigation of rec summaries. If you want to see what one of those looks like, read Butch Larkham's book, because he's got a couple of them that are really good. If you want railroad company documents for a particular rec, you need to go to that interstate commission uh, slide that I have shown you, and that is available in your notes. So we're done today, and I can unmute you now if you want to. If you have questions you would like to ask about this particular presentation today, go ahead and unmute yourself. 